I just wanted to add because I, I recently directed a trilogy um, uh, in a dance group uh, which was dealing with environment um, and its uh, ramifications and we worked very closely to the energy um, uh, so, you know people who really are writing policies about energy um, and what, what was very interesting I mean, because the whole we took their reports and we dram dramatized it and then we uh, created a dance out of it and we were engaging in conferences uh, with people who really are the policy makers and and one thing that came out of that was really uh, you know we, uh, I think first of all I mean the, the owning up that we are active um, participants in the inequity of environmental uh, disastrous uh, situation that we are creating. We meaning we individuals and of course there are certain nationalities that definitely are less affected compared to other nationalities. And the starting point is owning up that, uh, that we play a part and the effect will be on all of us. And it was so interesting that, uh, you know, with all our research uh, and, and, um, and when we were, uh, we were creating pieces, dance pieces, um, uh, you know, writing monologues, poems about these, but the policy makers kept trying to tell us, no, no, we already know that, uh, that we are, we are going to just talk about the wind power, that's an alternate methodology. But you know, here we were, worked with marine biologists who were talking about how, and also you know, people who have been dealing with you know uh, birds, ornithologists who were saying how this huge harvesting of areas where these wind mills are putting in, and how the how it is affecting the cloud rotation, and how it is affecting the entire ornithological uh, you know reality and the ecosystem. But there were people sitting in that room saying that this is a problem. You cannot. How can this? How can this scene uh, be about singing praises of uh, what they consider to be alternate uh, power? Uh, but you know what was interesting was we were trying to create a peace, and here there were two policymakers, <laughs> both talking about environment, but not talking to each other. And uh, so I mean, so I uh, we wasted three days trying to engage in a conversation because the point is. On the fourth day, the play has to open. <laughs> My bottom is on the line, you know. So, so I said that we are going to create a piece about both their opinions and really leave it to the audience to participate, because our job is to provoke questions, you know. Because sometimes, you know, and there was somebody who was very simplistic and asked me the question. So, where? What is your accountability? I said, well, at least it's not, uh, you know, a commitment not to answer and engage. Uh, you know, so uh, so beyond the consumers, uh, I think the people who write the policies are not talking to each other. You know, and I think uh, you know, we can, uh, we cannot discuss ecosystem without acknowledging the ecosystem that exists between us uh, in, uh, in the panel or, or between us uh, among people who are under the umbrella of environment. You know, and I think there's huge gaps between these separate offices. We thank everyone for the patience. Uh, this one is a very provocative one, and it's been at the forefront of a lot of discussion in Minnesota, particularly um, over the last year. Um, it's directed primarily towards Dr. Rao, but I'm also going to direct it to uh, Mr. Prabhakar as well. It's from Atul Shroff, and he asks, the pirating of international, uh, intellectual property in art and technology is um, a big issue today. And he says, do you see any changes in India so that innovation can excel at a greater pace? Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty prevalent problem. And it was uh, bigger in other parts of Asia. And now it's starting to be an issue in India as well, like uh, the, the person who asked the question uh, duly noted. Um, one of the ways. Um, at least we are looking at different again the models in the what we call the IP um, um, making it more available rather than patenting more of our technologies and our ideas and thoughts we are trying to more write disclosures and disclosures are more of saying who came up with this first but not preventing other people from using it 
And once they start using it, then we start negotiating on uh, licensing options on a whole different level than uh, as of patents. So it's a whole different model to combat uh, what was rightly brought up by uh, piracy by trying to be more open. And once the things are open, there's nothing to fire. It's more like that cable model. Exactly. <laughs> Make it more open. The more open standards we have, the less piracy there will be. Why do I get all the provocative questions I'm asking myself? Um, a couple of thoughts I have, and they're relatively informed. The first is consistent with what Sam said. There is a pay-what-you-wish model that can be employed. It's a legitimate uh, pricing model. Um, Radiohead um, is a British rock band. When they launched uh, their album In Rainbows, they offered it to their uh, customers for downloads uh, on the internet. And they said, pay what you wish. And 68% of downloads were for zero dollars, but 32% averaged six dollars a piece. And Tom York, the uh, Musician of the band uh, said he made more money off that one album than he made off any of his other albums because there were no intermediaries. So there is an economic model under which you can tolerate piracy. Uh, it is not uh, sustainable, I don't think, in the long run, unless you go to uh, an open source world or, and this is the hard part, you are constantly innovating so that whatever is being quote unquote stolen is not particularly valuable because you've got new technology um, in the pipeline and in inventory that's going to replace the, the, the technology that has been acquired in, which is really valueless in a week or two or a month or two. Since you just brought it up, I just couldn't resist. What is the number one paid utility bill in the US on time? I gave you so many hints already. Cable. Cable. People won't pay the heating bills and the electricity bills, but they pay the cable bill. <laughs> OK. Our final question of the evening is from Franklin Gumadi. And I'm going to direct it to Devankar Mukherjee and uh, the commissioner as well. How do the non-political, non-intellectual, non-business related people in other words, the masses of ordinary people in our community, enter the opportunity to connect the US and India. This is why you pay the big bucks, Dan. <laughs> well, that is a thoughtful question. I think um, there's probably no simple answer, but it, and there's a, a, a multiple of smaller answers. And it may start with organizations like this one, or other organizations that connect cultures. It may be uh, Facebook pages that connect our uh, cultures or participation in art and cultural opportunities or exchanging uh, recipes with uh, neighbors or posting recipes on blog sites that start to connect the commonality of interest across our cultures. I'm actually more optimistic about the, uh, this because of uh, social media sites and our country is having uh, a language uh, in common, not the only language, but a language in common, um, than I would be between uh, uh, many good parts of China where language is a barrier and where the internet is censored. Uh, and so I think, uh, uh, you know, that the term a thousand points of light is maybe misused, but small efforts can uh, make a big difference. Uh, I know that, for example, uh, Rotary Clubs in India and the U.S. have had exchange programs for 50 years, probably, that create small opportunities for people to get to know each other better as people uh, with no involvement by government or other uh, entities that can be very effective. But I'd be interested to know what other people will think about this one. I don't think that demographics should